All right, so again, um, hello and welcome to the Herring Migration Monitoring and Management webinar. We're delighted um, that all of you have joined us tonight. Um, some quick acknowledgements. Uh, this event is sponsored by our partner Revision Energy, um, which is an employee company owned B Corporation Solar Company with over 8,000 installed systems and 500, I'm sorry, in five locations in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. They are dedicated to both environmental and social justice. They're a company he really in line with the mission and values of the Watershed Council, and we are proud to work alongside them to solve climate change, which affects our Merrimack River watershed in all kinds of ways, from drought to floods, to urban heat island effect, to the warming waters that make life extremely tough for fish and wildlife. As solar energy costs have dropped by 74% in the last 10 years, Revision offers an opportunity to lock in clean energy at a rate that beats local utility. Their staff is awesome, so give them a call and have them over to your house for a visit to scope out your solar potential. Uh, please mention Mayor Mac River Watershed, and when you can, go solar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Hani. Uh, he is our speaker for tonight. Um, he is a professor of, professor of ecology at Emerson College and a conservation commissioner for the town of Andover. He also runs the annual herring count in the Shawshin River. So I'm gonna spotlight you, John. All right, thank you very much, Maya. Uh, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your Monday nights to join us. Uh, I'm really happy to be telling you about some of the work that we've been doing on the Shawshin River, uh, one of the tributaries of the Miramac. Let me get this to present. Okay, great. Uh, so yes, so I'm uh, John Honey. I've, I've uh, been working on the Shawshin River for about 12 years now. Uh, and uh, the, I, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Andover Trails Committee. I see that this cut off a little bit. I have to remember to, to rearrange uh, things on my slide a little bit, who uh, are co-sponsoring the uh, River Herring Count uh, on the Shawshin River as, as along with uh, the Andover Conservation Commission. So you guys are all familiar with the uh, river, uh, the Miramac River watershed. This is sponsored by the uh, Miramac River Watershed Council. Thank you all for hosting tonight. Uh, and I'll be telling you about one of the first big tributaries on the Miramac. So this is the Miramac here, and this is the Shawshin River watershed. Uh, and I, I moved here about 12 years ago from the West Coast where I was doing my graduate work and postdoctoral work. Uh, and I was studying uh, rivers uh, and I did my PhD looking at uh, aquatic insects and how they responded to salmon spawning. And then I went on to uh, do a postdoc at NOAA Fisheries where I was looking at uh, Chinook salmon response to uh, habitat changes. So I was super excited to move to this small town in Massachusetts and find out that they were talking about removing uh, two dams uh, in town. So I went to the public meetings at the uh, library, at the ta small town library, and it was they were surprisingly contentious to me because where I came from on the West Coast, most of the public was generally supportive of the removal of dams to uh, bring back you know, the iconic migratory fish. Uh, but I guess the migratory fish had been away from uh, the Shawshin River for so long that people had forgotten about it. And they were uh, really, uh, you know, the dams were wonderful. They're part of the history. Their grandparents had uh, uh, ice skated on the ice, uh, uh, on the reservoirs in the wintertime, and they were just part of the history of the town. So it was this dam uh, and this dam were the ones being discussed. And so, uh, but, but I could feel that it was gonna happen because the owners of the dam wanted, dams wanted them to be removed and there was a lot of support for the dams coming down. So I started uh, talking to the experts in the area to find out, well, what kinds of fish might respond so I could uh, apply my expertise and participate in this project. Uh, and everyone told me to look at river herring. Oh, so it's not existing conditions anymore. So this is my background, uh, part of my postdoctoral work with NOAA Fisheries where I was focused on West Coast salmon. And uh, folks here told me to look at river herring. These, these should be the fish that would respond in a way that people would really notice. 
Uh, and I talked to people like uh, Eric Hutchins and, and Noah and uh, Ben Gahagan with the Mass uh, Division of Marine Fisheries and uh, Joanne Muramoto down uh, on the Cape who runs all of the river herring counts there. Uh, and I learned uh, more about river herring from those guys and then I did research on my own. And you guys are familiar with river herring too, I think. It's not this, I, I was surprised to learn. Uh, this is actually Atlantic herring, one of their close cousins. It, the one in the can is this one on the bottom. And actually when they're in the ocean, they tend to school together frequently. Uh, and so that's actually one of the problems with river herring as because there's still an active fishery on Atlantic herring. So river herring, uh, suffer some bycatch from that fishery. Uh, but as I was saying just a second ago, you guys are probably familiar with river herring as part of these bait balls in the really popular uh, movies or, or documentaries like the Blue Planet, uh, where you have these large fish like sharks and dolphins uh, and marlins and things like that diving on into these uh, swirling uh, balls of bait fish, of forage fish, and then eventually you'll see just a couple left, uh, and you know they don't have much long for this, much longer for this world. Uh, but they also, uh, in addition to living part of their lives in marine systems, they come upstream to spawn, uh, sort of similar to salmon. So that was familiar to me. And, and they returned to west for to East Coast streams all up and down the coast from, from Florida all the way uh, north. So it actually goes further north than this. I borrowed this map from NOAA Fisheries, uh, a US federal agency. So they're focused on US states. But these guys go all the way up north into Canada, into uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, you see that the blueback herring uh, tend to go a little bit further south than the uh, alewives. Uh, and, and you notice now I've switched to two different things, alewives and blueback herring, when before I was talking about river herring. So I skipped that slide because I was talking about something else for a second. Uh, these are those two species and they're referred together as river herring because they do very similar things at about the same time and they're almost indistinguishable. You have to be a, a real expert to be able to look at the surfaces of their body and be able to tell them apart. Uh, and I, I know you guys are looking at these, uh, this slide, these two fish and saying, you know, you can pick out some differences between them, but I promise you almost everything you see there is just a trick of the light because the, the scales, the lights reflecting off their scales at different angles. Uh, and they're, they're, um, uh, their differences really are subtle unless you cut them open and you'll see that the, the abdominal cavity of the blueback herring uh, is a dark color, whereas it's a more silvery color with the uh, alewives. And we just can't be cutting them all open, uh, especially because this is a species of concern. So we lump them together as river herring. And that's distinct from herring. Typically when people say herring, we're talking about the Atlantic herring, which is a strictly marine species. So river herring are anadromous. That means they come up into freshwater systems to spawn. So you can just think of them as migratory uh, marine and freshwater fish. Right? So they come up uh, into streams of the of the East Coast. Am I ready for that now? Yeah, they come up into streams of the East Coast in April through June, depending on the temperature. The alewives come first. Uh, typically, they'll start migrating when the water temperature is about 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the, the blueback herring will come a couple of weeks later once the temperature is 5 to 10 degrees warmer. And the alewives tend to like to spawn in lakes and ponds. Uh, so they'll swim upstream until they get to some more still water and they'll start spawning once the water is even a little bit warmer. And they tend to lay uh, more eggs than the uh, blueback herring, which uh, only lay about 60 to 100,000 eggs, whereas you get 60 to 300,000 eggs uh, with the alewives. And the bluebacks, instead of spawning, or instead of preferring to spawn in lakes and ponds, they prefer to spawn in rivers and streams. But there does seem to be some hybridization and some bluebacks in slower water and some alewives in faster water. So maybe another reason to, uh, to lump them together as river herring. Well, the, the eggs will hatch and then the fry will rear for a few weeks and then towards the end of the summer, they'll start to migrate back uh, down into the estuary and toward the ocean. Uh, and I noticed that there's, looks like some folks are talking in the chat. I'm 
it's hard for me to, to open the chat and monitor it because it obscures some of my slides. So what I've asked is for Maya to keep track of the chat questions and the Q&A questions, uh, and then we'll get to those uh, at the end. Uh, I, I apologize, it's just hard for me to see that the way Zoom organizes things. Okay, so, uh, and Maya, if, if there seems to be like a really crucial question, like I've left something out or some uh, answer or some question really needs an answer right now, please just shout it out and, and I'll be happy to, to backtrack it and, and do that. All right, so the fry are migrating to the ocean uh, towards the end of the summer, and then they'll rear in the ocean for about two to five years, and then they'll make their way back to uh, rivers and streams and ponds and lakes to, to reproduce again, right? Uh, okay, so that's the life cycle that I learned about. And uh, you are familiar with the bait balls that we talked about just a second ago, but almost everything that can fit a river herring in its mouth also likes to eat it. So not just in the oceans, but all along, the along and inside the freshwater systems where they're coming back to spawn and, and to rear. So uh, otters, you saw the great blue heron just then, otters, uh, eagles, uh, and, and even the, the fish that, that we like to, to be fishing for, other, other species of fish like this, this bass. Uh, and uh, of course, if the populations are large enough like they are in some main rivers, like the Damariscata comes to mind, where there's just you know, hundreds of thousands of fish still, uh, river herring still spawning, uh, we can actually eat them as well. And they're, and they're really delicious fish if the populations are large enough to allow that. Uh, and we did eat them historically in, in huge numbers all up and down the, the east coast of the, of the US. And uh, once we uh, learned how to fish industrially really efficiently, those numbers increased even more. You see in the 50s and 60s, the, the, the size of the river herring harvest was just really big. And we were so efficient that we drove down their populations to a level where everybody got worried. Uh, and then a moratorium was instituted in, I think, 2006. And that's still ongoing today in Massachusetts and most states south of us. Uh, as I said, there's still some fisheries in Maine, right? And even though this moratorium has been going on for more than 10 years now, almost 15 years, uh, their numbers still haven't uh, managed to recover. Uh, and one of the one of the th things contributing to the the, the difficulty of recovering uh, these two species is just the amount of, of available spawning habitat to reproduce. Historically, they had a huge amount of freshwater habitat to reproduce in. So this is a figure from uh, Steve Maddox's master's thesis uh, from the UMass Amherst. And this shows uh, coastal rivers in Massachusetts from the from the Connecticut River system all the way uh, east and north to the Miramac River system. Uh, and you see what it looks like uh, after a few hundred years of dam building. We, they just no longer had the habitat that they had historically. So it was really challenging to support, almost it was impossible to support their historical numbers. There's something else I was going to say here. I'm not sure. Uh, so this gives you an idea of the numbers of dams that we have here in Massachusetts. Most of these are those 100-year-old, 200-year-old mill dams uh, that no longer serve a purpose. They're no longer turning a, a wheel to grind corn or uh, soften wool or do the other things that we did uh, with uh, those water wheels. Only about so this means like more than 80% of the dams in Massachusetts no longer serve a purpose except to hold back water. Uh, and of course, that's a problem uh, with uh, migratory fish, not just the river herring, uh, but also their cousins, the different species of shad like the American shad and gizzard shad, uh, the striped bass that like to eat the, the river herring are also migratory, the Atlantic, uh, Salmon, of course, uh, are impeded by uh, dams because they need to go upstream in rivers uh, to be able to reproduce. But then there's also um, more interesting, spe other interesting species. I don't mean to say they're more interesting species, uh, but like the lamprey, we've seen some of those on the Shaoxing River. Some of these get up to six feet long that I've seen, and it's really spectacular to watch these folks, uh, these guys come up 
stream to spawn. And then of course the American eel, which has everything backwards, it actually spawns out in the Atlantic Ocean. And then somehow the little glass eels, the tiny, tiny, tiny little things come back to our coastal rivers, uh, including the Merrimack, uh, and then they go up to grow larger until they reach adulthood, and then they go back out to the ocean to spawn. So these, all of these fish depend upon access to habitat, uh, freshwater habitat for different parts of their life stages, uh, and dams really reduce uh, uh, their access. All right, so dams have other problems just besides blocking migratory fish for people who care about those. Moving water has power, so that's why uh, rivers erode things. So this moving water is carrying sediment, and as soon as it hits a reservoir behind a dam, like this Conowingo Dam uh, on the Susquehanna River uh, in Maryland, uh, the water loses its power and that sediment drops out of the water. So this dam accumulates two million tons of sediment every single year, two million tons of sediment. So if you think about all of the dams on rivers up and down the East Coast, so you saw those 3000 dams in Massachusetts, uh, this is a figure that was published in uh, the journal Science uh, over 10 years ago showing the density of mill dams. So this is mill dams. Add on top of that all of the hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams like the Conowingo Dam uh, and the Essex Dam in, uh, on the Miramac, that first big uh, dam as you go upstream from the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and that is hundreds of millions of tons of sediment every year that's being blocked from entering our entering the ocean, estuaries in the ocean. So as a consequence, our uh, coasts are eroding. So yes, sea level's rising as well. And here in New England, it's risen by about uh, 10 inches uh, over the last 100 years or so. But in addition to sea level rise, you also get more erosion if you're not having uh, the beaches replenished by, by sediment coming from our rivers as it's being eroded away with each storm. All right, uh, and a, a study came out uh, not quite 10 years ago now showing that almost 70% of our beaches uh, in New England and the Mid-Atlantic are eroding uh, because of these processes. Right. So other, other problems with dams, especially these, uh, these mill dams, uh, they cause these uh, hydraulic vortices that can trap people. And in fact, uh, I think it was 1984, there was a canoe race on the Shaoxin River and a young man unfortunately lost his, lost his life in that uh, being caught in one of these vortexes uh, caused by one of these old dams. And they can also fail because they're not producing any income for the owners. The owners don't tend to maintain them. So uh, a big rain event comes and the dams are degraded and then they'll fail like this one that happened in uh, South Carolina a little over 10 years ago. Uh, and in order to try and uh, uh, protect themselves from these sorts of dangers, uh, dam owners can buy, or, or let me back up just a little bit, sorry. So this, this almost happened more close to home in the town of Ta Taunton in 2005, where after a big rain event in the fall of that year, they had to evacuate the downtown area because it looked like one of their old mill dams on the Mill River was going to fail. Uh, and now I'm getting to the point about insurance. So the dam owners could buy insurance to protect themselves from the cost of, of dam failure, but that's really expensive, especially if your dam isn't producing any value, any monetary value for you, uh, or you could actually repair the dam. Uh, and that could be even more expensive than removing the dam in some cases. So this is one of the dams that, I, that I've been talking about on the Shaoxin River that actually got uh, removed. So you can see some of these really old mill dams are in very poor shape. They're basically just a pile of, of really large rocks. All right. And so the town of Taunton uh, decided that it just wasn't worth the risk. Uh, and there were so many interested parties uh, wanting to help support this dam removal process from federal agencies to state agencies to environmental groups that the money and the funding and the effort was available there to get these dams removed and more and more towns are starting to do that and the effort here in massachusetts is being led by the division of ecological restoration and these uh, magenta colored circles are the projects that are already completed. So these two are the ones I've been focusing on, two dams that were removed on the Shaoxin River. And this is one of them. 
uh, what it used to look like. This was built actually a little bit newer than some of them. It was built in 1920 by who by a man who was the richest man in the world then, William Madison Wood. He owned most of the, the mill complexes in, in Lawrence, uh, and he had his administrative building right next to this dam, and he had it built just to produce some white noise to make working there uh, more pleasant for his administrators. So this was a little powerhouse that generated a tiny amount of electricity, but but mostly this was just an ornamental dam. So we that was removed at the, let me make sure I got my dates right. Yeah, at the beginning of 2017, so this shows uh, some of the process of removing that. They had to shift the river over to the side in order to be able to work there. So it went from this to this picture that I took uh, just a few months later in late spring. And then the other dam uh, was the Marlin Street Dam. Uh, and I've shown you a couple of pictures of that already. So no longer existing conditions. This is a photo of it being removed uh, in late, 2016, so I think December 2016. Uh, so it went, so this is standing on the dam, looking upstream at the reservoir created by the dam before it was removed, looking at Stevens Street, if you're familiar with Andover. So the post office is right behind these trees. And so this is what it looked like after the dam was removed. So we'll just go this to this. So it's quite different. And then at the, so this is, uh, December, essentially, uh, December of 2016. So that summer, it looked like this. So a, a lot of people who live near uh, areas where dams are being removed or, or some have, it, have some attachment to the area are really concerned that they're going to be left with a mud pit. You often hear this term of a mud pit after we take out the dam. And yet it does leave a mud pit for the first couple of weeks, but um, no permits are going to be issued for dam removal without restoration work. And we have to do this we have to hold down the sediment and prevent invasive species from uh, colonizing the newly opened area. We have to plant the area with native species that grow up then. Uh, and so you don't get a mud pit. In fact, you get a really pleasant new park-like area that, you know, for my money is way better looking than this. But anyway, uh, certainly it's, it's easier to pass if you're on a canoe or a kayak or if you're a migratory fish trying to get upstream. So uh, I, I went, I, I talked with the experts, uh, including uh, the director of conservation, uh, Bob Douglas, who knows the Shawshin River well about trying to find a location on the river uh, where we could count fish as they were coming upstream to spawn. Uh, and uh, Eric Hutchins with NOAA Fisheries took Bob and I uh, around to look at some other uh, herring, river herring count uh, operations uh, in the North Shore. Ben Gehagen with Mass uh, Division of Marine Fisheries did the same thing. Uh, and putting all that expertise together, we found this location. So this is Stephen Street, the street I mentioned earlier. Before, when I was standing on the dam, this is about where it used to be, looking upstream at the reservoir. This is the post office. And there's a pedestrian bridge right here that makes a great location, very safe. We don't have to worry about passing cars. There's a, uh, there's actually, this is a parking lot on this side and cars don't have access really at all on this side, except uh, ones on you know, official landscaping business, I suppose. So it's a really safe place to look down over this railing to watch fish go by and count them. Uh, and so uh, we got a lot of help from uh, folks in town. Uh, local uh, outdoorsmen and craftsmen made this tiny kiosk for us so we could protect our data sheets. And he made this tiny little frame for our thermometer that the uh, volunteers would use to measure air temperature. And we had another thermometer for measuring water temperature. Uh, and lots of other folks in town helped us in other aspects. This is uh, Dave Van Doren. He helped uh, design these contrast plates uh, along with uh, Bob Dalton, one of the town firemen who also happens to be the president of the Native Fish Coalition. They designed these contrast plates uh, and Dave here built them. And then uh, all of these guys and me and, and Craig Liversidge and a bunch of other folks helped lower these things into the river so we could actually see the fish. Otherwise they'd be swimming by and you know their dark dorsal surfaces that prevent them from being seen and preyed upon by birds and also counted by volunteers. This uh, defeats that so we can actually see the fish. So uh, 
then we ask people to come and help us count the fish. All you have to do is just watch the, watch the river for 10 minutes uh, whenever you're free. Uh, and it's, it's really as simple as that and enter in the data, uh, your observations in that data sheet that I showed you a second ago in that mini kiosk. Uh, and we had lots of people come and help us. This is students from Andover High School. It's less than a, a mile away. Uh, and they came down frequently. Uh, Melanie Cutler helped out a lot with that effort, bringing her students. She's one of the teachers uh, at Andover High. She teaches this in advanced placement environmental science class. So we got a lot of help. In fact, we got more than 300 uh, people to help us uh, volunteer. Of course, that was padded a bit with uh, students, uh, whole classes coming down to help. Uh, but, it, but it was wonderful to have so much participation. Uh, this is the data sheet. So each row is one person's observation. So uh, this person writes down their name, they write down their weather observations. So you see if it's from no clouds or one to 25% clouds all the way up to moderate to heavy rain or snow or other, you write down that code here. You write down something about the water clarity here, either excellent, fair or poor. Uh, write down the air temperature, the water temperature, the time that your count began. Uh, and then how many fish you saw. And then if you happen to see some other things, you can write that down as well. Uh, you see during this uh, day, not many river herring were seen, only one river herring was observed. And, and we have those days, especially uh, this was early April uh, and mainly the fish don't return to the Shaoxing River until really the last week of April uh, and the first couple of weeks of May. Because, and I think that may be so much later than lots of other coastal streams around here, just because the Miramac is much colder coming down uh, from New Hampshire. But that, that's just a hypothesis. Uh, so last year we had to do things a bit differently. Uh, this is us putting in the contrast plates, those things that are on the uh, stream bed so we could actually see the fish. Uh, this was almost exactly one year ago. And if you can remember what it was like in April of last year, there was just so much uncertainty. So even though we were wearing gloves and outside and wearing masks, we were still pretty skittish about being close to each other. But we wanted to try and do as much as we could to facilitate this river herring count to give people things to do uh, as they were, uh, you know, what was it safe at home is one of the, the phrases. Uh, that was keeping us at home. So this is us lowering in those contrast plates. Uh, and another change that we made is we put everything online. So the data sheets, we didn't want people to have to handle things other people had been handling. So we posted this QR code at the count site. So all you have to do is point your phone at this and we'll be doing this again this year. You just point your phone at this and it takes you to an online version of the data sheet where you can just enter all the information in on your phone. So it takes you to this, where you just enter in the date. This gives you a few details about the location. And this is the Andover Trails website where you can go to get information, more information about the count. Uh, and here's where, again, you record the weather. Uh, and did I skip a Yeah, and then water clarity, and then the beginning of your count, and then the number of river herring that you see. And then if you happen to see anything else, you just put it here. So uh, another thing that I've added to that online data sheet is uh, some pictures of the river herring. So I know uh, probably some of you are thinking, well, what am I looking for? Uh, aren't there more other fish that I might confuse river herring with? Well, river herring are about a foot long. So they'll range from about nine inches to 15 inches. Uh, and they typically occur in groups of two to, to six or, or so. Uh, occasionally they'll be by themselves but typically they're in uh, tiny groups. The only thing that you're likely to confuse it with is uh, a trout. Uh, and as sort of an extra challenge for us, the state actually stocks thousands of trout in the Shaoxin River uh, just weeks before the, the count happens. So uh, the, they've actually already stocked the river this year. And the bridge that we're standing on is a wonderful hiding place for trout that don't wanna be eaten. Uh, so lots of trout are actually under the bridge and they're territorial. So they're constantly fighting each other for a position under that great hiding place. And every now and then one will lose its, a battle and will get kicked downstream and go over the counting sheet. 
So it's obvious that it got kicked out from underneath the bridge. Uh, its shape is different. It's got a much more rounded head. Its tail is not deeply forked. Notice these river herring have much more narrow heads. Their tails are very deeply forked. And if you put them together, it looks, they look very quietly different and they behave very different where the trout will be by themselves almost always unless they're together fighting each other. Uh, the river herring will tend to be in, in larger or in yeah, larger groups of at least two. And the, the river herring aren't just hanging around. They're going upstream. Sometimes we've noticed they'll stop for a few seconds at the contrast sheet, just because that's something new that uh, they haven't passed over. Uh, so they'll pause there for a second and then they'll just zoom upstream. Uh, and some of them won't even stop. They'll just keep going upstream. So these guys are clearly on a mission, whereas the trout are generally kind of meandering around. So the behavior is really different, the shape's different, even if the size, uh, the length is really similar. Especially once you've seen a couple trout and seen a couple river herring, you won't have any trouble distinguishing between the two. All right, so these are the results of our count. We've been counting since that first year. And, and I should point out that, yeah, we did see fish that very first year, just like a month or two after the dams were removed. Uh, and that was a wonderful surprise. So we uh, had our 10 minute observations. We had a few hundred of those. We collect, we, I wrote down the data into a spreadsheet and I sent it off to John Shepard, who's also with the Mass uh, Division of Marine Sh Fisheries. Uh, and he uses a protocol de developed by Gary Nelson there uh, in order to estimate, uh, extrapolate from our counts, how many river herring likely spawned uh, above where we counted. So that first year was roughly about 15,000 fish. We had about 17,000 the next year. It went down for 2019 to around 500 fish and then was back up to around a little over a thousand fish or around a thousand fish uh, last year. We didn't have quite as many counters, nearly as many counters last year because of the COVID protocols. We actually discouraged people from coming. So it was only me uh, and a small group of other people trying to go there every day. So that's why the error bars are one of the reasons why the error bars are so large here. We're hoping that it can be uh, conducted safely this year and we can have more participation, especially uh, everyone's accustomed to social distancing now and we're less nervous uh, about doing that. Uh, and yeah, so I'll leave that at that. And these numbers that we uh, estimated for the Shashin River above where we were uh, match or at least correspond pretty well to observations on the Miramac River. These are those. So they've been counting fish there for about 30 years uh, at an elevator at the Essex Dam where, where Route 28 goes over the uh, Miramac River in Lawrence. So there's uh, actually an elevator there at a power station uh, it, last year it was up or last year and for several years before that it was operated by NL, but they've been uh, bought out by another company that I wrote down yesterday and I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but so they operate that uh, power station and the fish ladder uh, and the numbers go to the US Fish and Wildlife, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Agency. I, I'm not saying that right. For some reason it's not, uh, I'm, I can't think of the name of that uh, agency. So you see our numbers in red here superimposed on this. We were low in 2017, higher and low. And then I couldn't find the numbers for 2020 there and it may be because uh, of the COVID precautions. Uh, so yes, so, and this also reminds me, there was a question that Maya sent me from one of, from somebody who might be in our audience now, John Cuneo, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, but he asked if there were other river herring counts on the Miramac River uh, or other tributaries. Uh, and, and so this is the count that I'm aware of on the Miramac River. And I know there's also uh, another river herring count on the Concord River, which is the next major tributor, tributary uh, upstream. So that's being conducted by the Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust uh, at the Cent Centennial Island Fish Ladder. So uh, they have a really wonderful program. Uh, and if you just type in on your browser, lowellandtrust.org, 
it'll take you to this main menu and you can pull down what do we do, then go to Concord River programs, then go to fish monitoring program and it'll take you to this page I'm at right now. At least I think this is the page I'm at right now. Uh, and you'll be able to find their uh, river herring uh, count information there. And they have some tutorials that are really wonderful. Uh, and they're also encouraging uh, everyone to come to their count uh, if they're able. So uh, this is, so I've mentioned Ben Gahagan a couple of times now. This is the guy with the, with the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries. This is him and Mike Bailey with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, that is service, that's the word I was trying to remember. Where they're installing this device, I don't even know what it's called, but the fish swim through there uh, and the counters are able to count the fish from this. At least I think that's what this is for. So I know this is on the Concord River at the location where they will be counting, but I haven't been there myself to see how their count operates. Uh, so these guys are two of the most knowledgeable river herring folks around. So if you have any questions about river herring in Massachusetts, Definitely Ben Gahagan is the person to ask. And I, I would guess if you have any questions about river herring uh, on other tributaries, uh, like in New Hampshire of the Miramac, Mike Bailey would be the one to talk to. So uh, these are great guys. Uh, and this is the Concord River, that other count there. Uh, and But if you happen to be closer to Andover, then please come help us count. You can park here in Shawshin Plaza. If you recognize this area, this is the North, North Main Street, so Route 28, north of downtown. This is Stephen Street and the post office. You can park here in uh, Shawshin Plaza parking lot, you know, right next to Stop and Shop. There's a street light here with a crosswalk, a pedestrian crosswalk. You can just press the button and wait for the signal. It'll give you a free pass to cross. Then you take this little sidewalk that'll, and you can go here too. You can take this little sidewalk to our pedestrian bridge and everything will be set up there within the next couple of days. Yesterday, in fact, am I ready for this? Yeah, yesterday, in fact, uh, we put in the newly designed contrast sheets. So this is Dave Van Doren again, and this is uh, Bob Dalton, that president of the Native Fish Coalition. They designed uh, a new version of these uh, contrast sheets. And you see, they just took some street signs. We can do that because Dave works for the street, or works for the, works for the town, and he uh, has access to the all these old uh, street signs that would be discarded. He put the heavy end of a plow blade, so this is the part that's right where the street is, to reinforce snow plow blades, uh, and it makes these really heavy, and then put some roofing material, some smooth roofing material on top of that, uh, and then we lowered that into the river yesterday morning. So this is what it looks like now. And I think this is one of the best designs we've come up with so far. It's much easier to work with. The very first year, 2017, we actually had material that people used to wrap their boats in uh, plastic in the wintertime, that really thick white plastic material. And if you can imagine trying to put that in a river and the water was maybe twice as high as it is right now, uh, it was like you know trying to, to fold a sail or move a sail around during a windstorm. It was really difficult and dangerous. So this is much safer uh, to use. And, and it, I think it works better as well as far as seeing fish. And we immediately saw some fish. So this is yesterday, as soon as we put the fish down, these, these are not river herring. Uh, Bob Dalton, our, our native fish expert <laughs> said they were- uh, Oh yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Salt, 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 salt. Salt. Oh wow. White suckers, sorry. White suckers spawning. So when they were just swirling around constantly back and forth uh, between the bridge and the contrast plates. So that was pretty cool to see. Uh, and this is an example of even if you don't see river herring, there's still so many other cool things to see. Even if you don't see anything, uh, it's really pleasant to watch the river for 10 minutes. Uh, and often you do see really cool things besides these uh, spawning white suckers that we saw yesterday in previous years. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Will I be able to go forward one? Yeah. In previous years, we've seen these uh, carp also going upstream to spawn. And these guys seem to really love uh, the contrast sheets. Uh, and they just went back and forth for about 30 minutes or so. And these are really big fish. These are each about like two feet long. So they were pretty fun to watch. And then 
uh, Floyd Greenwood, one of my fellow conservation commissioners, put his GoPro in the water and filmed this uh, gizzard shad right after the dams were removed. So this was really wonderful to see because we, we imagine that if gizzard shad are coming upstream, then probably American shad, will, which you know there's a fishery for on the Miramac, probably those guys are going to come upstream as well. Uh, and then can you make out what this is? This was taken by one of the high school students or maybe their teacher. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit and you can get a better picture. Can you tell what it is yet? I have. I can zoom in one more time in a second. Nobody's writing them. I ah, good. Corey, Corey got it. Uh, all right, so yeah, and, and it was really big uh, snapping turtle. Its carapace was more than one foot in, in diameter at, and uh, you know, we didn't, didn't have a ruler there, uh, but it, it looks like it could have been, you know, maybe up to two feet. And I know other people have seen snapping turtles that big in that area. Uh, so even if this one isn't uh, as giant as I'm describing, there, there are like lots of big turtles there. Uh, and it's pretty cool to see. So all kinds of really cool things. Uh, if you are in the area within, uh, I would say, within the next few days until June or so, please stop by. It only takes 10 minutes of watching the river. Uh, and uh, Maya ha has a sign up that you can use if, if you'd like to use that. Uh, but 10 minutes is all it takes uh, of watching the river. And, and I think this ended a little bit sooner than, I don't know, I guess uh, it did end at about 45 minutes. It felt like it went faster to me. I, and I uh, hope it went fast for you guys as well. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing to see if you all have any questions. Thank you so much, John. Um, that was super interesting. And I know some people were asking in the chat, um, we will be having, uh, we will have this recording available to everyone, both um, on our YouTube page uh, tomorrow, by tomorrow, and also I will be linking that in the follow-up email that we'll be doing as well, along with the sign-up form to go out and participate in the annual herring count. So yeah, we have a few Q&A questions. So um, if you'd like me to read those aloud to you, John, or if you want to just go ahead and read them for yourself, whatever. Sure, I, can, I can see them now pretty easily. So I'll just start at the top. Are the herring even going to make it into the Shawshin given how low the river is this spring? Yes, uh, they they usually, well, if it gets a whole lot lower then, then perhaps not, but they're definitely getting, they would get into the Shawshin if other years, uh, if we can use that as an example, because we've had them in other low water years. Uh, so I fully expect that they will be here. Uh, it does depend on temperature and, uh, so I don't know when exactly they'll be here. Uh, and some years are different because it depends on, uh, seems like water flow also makes a difference. Uh, and sometimes high water seems to be able to, seems to delay them. Uh, but we really don't have enough years of data to, uh, on this system to uh, be able to predict at all. We just kind of go by, they, they show up at the end of April to early May. So, uh, and today's observations of the Little River in Haverhill revealed a school resembling blueback swimming upstream to the Stevens Dam. Uh, it's more likely alewife at this time. You know, I don't know. Uh, it, I think it's warm enough that it could be blueback, but I don't see how there's any way anybody could identify them just by looking at them. I think even Ben Gehagen, you know, this may be blasphemy and sorry, Ben. Uh, I don't think he would be able to do it just looking down at them in the water. Uh, but yeah, timing would be important. I would expect alewife to come before blueback. Uh, but I but I don't know at this point what the it's it's possible that ale, some alewife came earlier and now some bluebacks are coming, you know, I don't know. So in the next, given the Shawshin was dammed for so long, how did the river hang discover it's now accessible? That's a great question. Thank you. So uh, 
uh, alewives and blueback herring stray, like lots of migratory fish. And what that means is not all of them go back exactly where they were hatched, where, they, where their parents spawned and they were hatched. Uh, and I think there's about a 20% stray rate, which means about 20% of the fish will just go to a new river. Uh, and that's wonderful for colonizing after some sort of natural disaster, like maybe a landslide or something like that, or glaciation, that's a really slow moving, or the glaciers recede and they recolonize those areas. So it's really important to have straying in order to recolonize after, after natural disasters, natural disturbances. Uh, and so that helps them after dams as well. And of course, there was a substantial amount of the Shaoxing River uh, downstream of the dams that we expect uh, river herring were using uh, even while those dams were present. So these are just species, these are just uh, individuals whose parents would have probably been spawning there or elsewhere in the Miramax system. All right, and next. Uh, any dam or any plan or incremental benefit in removing the Ballard Vale Dam? Uh, yes, that would actually be the greatest benefit for the river herring just because there's so much more uh, spawning habitat available upstream of the Ballard Vale habitat or the Ballard Vale Dam uh, than there is upstream of these dams. These dams opened up, uh, I'm just pulling it off the top of my head, so this may be wrong, but about four miles of uh, four river miles of habitat. Whereas the Ballard Vale Dam behind that, there's like more than 80 miles of river habitat. So uh, maybe someday. Uh, but for right now, the, the owners of the Ballard Vale Dam really like the white noise sound uh, and they like the history of the of the dam, the reservoir, uh, and the mill complexes associated with that. So we can't remove dams, uh, or it's we're, the the dam owners don't want it removed, so they're not being removed right now. They're in relatively decent shape. Next is. It sounds like the contrast plates are put in for the count and then taken out. Is that the case? Yes, that's the case. We'll take them out in early June. Would predators ever get wise about the contrast plates as a place to hunt the fish or are they swimming by so fast that it makes no difference? Uh, yeah, I think in this case, the contrast plates are so, they don't extend very far. I think only about maybe three feet. Uh, and so the, the river herring would be, uh, would be by so fast. I don't think that would, give a lot of predators time to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe as the, the population gets large enough, that'll happen. Uh, and in fact, once the population gets large enough, I don't think there'll be any way we could possibly count them all. Almost every other river herring count that I've seen uh, is in a very narrow area where they've forced the fish to go up a ladder, for example. And so it's very constrained and they can count the fish in a small area that fits in somebody's field of view. Whereas we've got 30 feet to look at. And so it works as long as we're only seeing, you know, six fish at a time. But once we, if we ever are fortunate enough to get a healthy run of river herring someday, we won't be able to count them all that way. Uh, and I think that'll be a wonderful problem. I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, and next, uh, why 2019 such low counts? I don't know. I have no idea. We don't have enough uh, information at, to be able to guess that. And the marine system is a, uh, I was going to say it's a big black box, but it is a big black box. Uh, there's just so much we don't know about their lives there. Uh, and then, so that was that. And then how far up the Miramac uh, can the river herring go? I think that is uh, a Mike Bailey question. I do not know the answer to that. He's with the US Fish and Wildlife and I bet he would be very happy to answer that question. Uh, and thank you, Paulina. And your question is, what will the data that you're gathering be used for? So we send it to uh, Mass Division Marine Fisheries. I mentioned John Shepard uh, curates that data. Uh, and you know, the goal someday is to be able to know when we have healthy populations again, and we might be able to start harvesting them again. There's actually one river in Massachusetts that has taken such good care of, of their uh, river herring population that they have the numbers where they can do that. The reason they're not is that they would be the only river herring fishery in Massachusetts, and then they're afraid people will come uh, and devastate all their hard work. So the goal is to have lots of rivers have healthy runs of river herring again, uh, and then we can open up a fishery. 
So that's that's one of the ultimate goals. And of course, you know, as we as I said earlier, these are forage fish, so they help support other fisheries uh, in marine systems. And then um, any river herring sighted uh, yet this year? Not in the Shashin River yet, uh, but it sounds like there's been some activity on the Miramac. Uh, and it's It's jumping around, so it's hard for me to read. How much farther up the Shashin do river herring go to spawn? They go until there's still one remaining dam, that Ballard Vale Dam that somebody mentioned earlier. So uh, they stop there, so and they're not able to get further upstream. And every year we go, um, most years when we go, we're able to see a couple of river herring uh, there at the dam, uh, unable to go up further upstream. And then do river herring have a role in muscle reproduction or in other ecological processes once they come up into the river? That's a wonderful question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, I do know Bill McDowell, uh, an ecology professor who hosted a, a talk, a symposium on research on the Shashin River. He's uh, a mollusk, ex, a freshwater mollusk expert. Uh, and that would be a great question for him. You can find him at Miramac College. Uh, and now that you've asked it, I'm wondering the same thing. Uh, and so I will probably ask him ha as well. And if we have a way to get back to you guys, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, that, I like that question. Uh, can fish counts be done with video? It is done with video on many other streams. Uh, the, a great example is the Mystic River. Uh, they have a video uh, monitoring system and it's actually posted uh, on their website and anybody in the world can help them count their herring, so their river herring. So I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't know how we could do it uh, because ours is 30 feet across, uh, but it's something that we're thinking about and we'd love to figure out a way to, to be able to do that. And then uh, what do river herring do when they reach a dam? Spawn there and turn around? Yeah, that's my guess is that uh, they would uh, either spawn right there or move further downstream uh, and spawn because uh, they definitely can't go further. When I was working in uh, on the West Coast, I was working on a stream that had a waterfall and I would compare aquatic uh, insect communities downstream and upstream of the waterfall. And so I had to pass this waterfall many times. Uh, and I was, and that stream had a lot of chum salmon and those fish would actually kill themselves trying to get upstream and they didn't even spawn. So uh, it's conceivable that river herring do this but I don't know enough about that aspect of river herring ecology to be able to answer that question. All right, so alewives were introduced uh, to Lake Winnipesaukee for helping feed game fish in the past and I believe are in the Winnipesaukee River and probably upper Merrimack in New Hampshire. Do you know if this is a self-sustaining population? And if so, are there any genetic issues if they interbreed with true anadromous fish? Would they move downstream and in intersect wild fish? I, that's a great question and I wish I could answer that. I do not know the answer to that. Uh, it's possible that the Lake Winnipesaukee fish yeah, yeah, I just don't know uh, enough even about the dams between the Essex Dam and Lake Winnipesaukee to know what sort of obstacle course uh, an Adramus River herring would, if they have access that far up. I don't know how many of those dams have fish ladders. So I think that's another Mike Bailey question. And then what are other species that thrive if river herring comes back in large numbers? Uh, anything that could eat them really. Uh, uh, one of our conservation staff, Ben Mead, actually caught a white perch at the foot of the Ballard Vale Dam. So if, if, you're, uh, if you're familiar with that species, it's a close relative of the striped bass, even though it's called a perch, uh, they're, they're close cousins. And it's also a marine fish that will come up into freshwater systems, often following river herring. So we expect, you know, sport fish like that will definitely benefit if their prey populations get larger, uh, but really anything that can eat them. So these things are, the questions are going really fast. So what other species will thrive if river herring, so I just read that one. Uh, will you ever use buckets to get the river herring pa past the dam? I have been, I totally, I, I plan on doing that. I saw the example to that, uh, of that on the Mystic River before they uh, put in the new fish ladder. Uh, there was somebody who had organized that for years and years to get the community to help and to draw attention to uh, the fact that we have this species of concern 
uh, being blocked from its historical habitat. So absolutely, if we get enough fish returning, I definitely plan to organize a so-called bucket brigade to get river herring over the dam. Mike Bailey, the guy whose name I've been invoking so many times, uh, he has uh, brought, he often brings uh, river herring that they uh, catch at the elevator at the Essex Dam and, and takes it to other rivers, other tributaries of the Miramac River. And he's actually brought some river herring from that elevator to the upper part of the Shaoxin River to help us jumpstart our population. So uh, yeah, anything that we can do to help uh, increase their numbers. You mentioned that eating river herring does the mercury that impacts all our rivers not affect them? I would guess it would if they stayed in rivers long enough to rear. Uh, and I don't know that that's the case. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't know enough about uh, the uh, cycling of, of mercury to know if it's more of a problem in freshwater systems or marine systems. That, that's also a, a, a wonderful question that I, that I just don't have the answer to. Uh, fish, but typically fish that are much lower on the feed chain, a uh, food chain, don't, uh, you know, they don't have as many opportunities to bioaccumulate. Uh, Mike Bailey's there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I didn't realize you were here. Thank you. Uh, but I was just saying, I, I, eating lower on the food chain is always best if you're worried about heavy metals, which bioaccumulate. Um, we have one question that was asked in the chat. Um, up at the top, which is whether or not combined sewer overflows affect um, river herring and their populations. It can't be good, but uh, I don't know that that's been studied. I don't know of, of yeah, I haven't seen that study. Uh, but you know, CS, CSOs, combined sewer overflows, it's just when sewers overflow during storm events into rivers and other bodies of water that uh, sewage treatment plants uh, empty out into just because sewage treatment plants can't accommodate all that water coming from the storm. So they just open the floodgates. Uh, obviously nasty stuff uh, coming from our streets and, and our sewage systems. So it can't be good for them. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what the impacts would be. So it looks like the questions have slowed down. Thank you all very much for some wonderful questions. It's got me thinking about things I hadn't thought about before. And thanks, Mike, for saving me, Mike Bailey. I hope all that right. you're able to bring some more river herring to the Shaoxin, but I know you're a busy guy. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, John, for um, presenting. That was really amazing and we also again want to thank our sponsor Vision Energy um, and we hope everyone enjoyed this presentation. As a reminder I will be sending out an email tomorrow both with links on uh, signing up for the annual herring count as well as um, a few other information about um, MRWC. So again thank you all for coming and we hope you have a good night. Thanks very much. <laughs>